Well, I want to thank Jamie for asking me to come. It's such an honor to play in the Lemuel Chandler House here and to talk to you a little bit about the music of the Allegheny Front, um, where, where you happen to be right now, if, in case you didn't know. Uh, music of the Allegheny Front, sort of from the first pioneers through the Civil War. And Beverly, of course, plays an important role. First permanent settlement west of the Alleghenies. First permanent town west of the Alleghenies. Um, the Stanton Parkersburg Turnpike, of course, came through here. And, of course, the Civil War history, the Battle of Rich Mountain. And so I thought I would give you a sort of an overview of, of the traditional music of this part of West Virginia. And uh, it starts way back with the first people who came across the mountains in the, in the early 1700s, uh, first half of the 1700s, with traditional, this, this is, the, this is the, the king of the old time music instruments, is the fiddle. And the fiddle came with the first European settlers to, to what is now West Virginia. Of course, it was, well, it was West it was Virginia, but it was, some people called it Vandalia, some people called it uh, Augusta, Augusta County, Virginia was headed, if you look at old maps, it just goes off as far as they knew mm -hmm. and said it was between these two lines, so it would have taken us all the way out to the Pacific Ocean if they'd done it. <laughs> <laughs> you could get there from here, um, which you can. Um, so anyway, this, this is the first instrument that came, and the fiddle is sort of king for a couple of reasons. One is it's, it's in sort of the range of the human voice, and I think that gives it a certain resonance for us. It's small, it's lightweight. You can make them, you can make a workable fiddle fairly easily with just a few hand tools. Um, not anything as, as pretty as either of these, but um, you can make something that works with just a few hand tools. And so people were able to do that. And there's a great European tradition of fiddle music. And so many of the people, the pioneers, who came here were of, uh, came from places with great fiddle traditions. We all think of the Scots, or as they call them, the Scotch-Irish. Uh, Scots who came through Northern Ireland to, to this part of the world. But also, is there, there's a great English fiddling tradition. There are a lot of Germans who came here, and there's a great German fiddling tradition, a great tradition of uh, fiddle making in Germany. As a matter of fact, this fiddle was made in Germany in 1798. So uh, the Italians and the Germans and the French, but uh, great fiddle makers for hundreds and hundreds of years. So fairly easy to transport. And I'll talk about this instrument in a, <clears throat> in a few minutes. But I'm going to start with a with a very old tune, probably one of the oldest tunes that I know, and it goes it goes back to the, the border counties of England and Scotland, and it's probably a 400-year-old tune. And if you listen to it, four or 500 years old, and if you listen to it, it's very archaic, it's very simple. It's called Let's Hunt the Horses. <laughs> and this comes from the playing of Eden Hammonds, who was from Pocahontas County and Webster County. So just south of here. There were Hammonds and he had cousins in Huttonsville and, and whatnot too. So here we go. This is called Let's Hunt the Horses. Thank you. 
much. Um, as you can hear, that tune's all about drone. It's all about intensity and power. And there's some notes that really don't fit on a piano keyboard. They don't fit to the tempered scale. Uh, and a lot of these old tunes, the very oldest ones, don't fit to a standard scale. And you'll hear that, that uh, third note, right? That wonderful dissonance, that sort of <laughs> tension that's then released. So that's, uh, that's Let's Hunt the Horses. Um, there are a lot of places, come on in, make yourselves at home. I, you're absolutely fine. Come on, come right on in. Make yourselves at home. This is a living room, so make yourselves a, or a parlor. I don't know. I, it would have been called a parlor because the term living room was coined in the early part of the 20th century. Right. It's true because people associated parlors with laying out the dead. Right. And so when they were trying to re-sell people on the idea of furniture and home decorating and building new homes, uh, they coined the term, the term living room was coined to separate it from the parlor where when home burials were done, of course, people would lay a body out in the parlor so that you could come and visit. Still, they still say funeral parlor. This is the extra little, you know, etymological language history that I throw in for free. Um, so, these are, uh, but there are a number of tunes, I wanted to play you some, these are really West Virginia specific tunes, and this is one called You Piney Mountain. It's another very old tune that has uh, some of the same drone. You'll hear it's a little more melodic though, a little more going on in the tune. And the Upine Mountains, that was the local name for what is now, if you've ever been on the Highland Scenic Highway and looked out to the west, you've, over into Nicholas County, uh, those are the Upine Mountains. And the Upine was the local name for the Red Spruce, which was at the highest elevations. And uh, a prized prized wood for fiddle tops. Also, red spruce from Cheat Mountain um, was specifically ordered, because it was known to be so gross, so tall and straight, specifically ordered and shipped out of Cass, West Virginia, to a couple of brothers in Dayton, Ohio, with a bicycle shop, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, and they built their flyers out of spruce from that was grown up on Cheat Mountain and shipped out of Cass. So... Anyway, this is called You Piney Mountain, and this is one of my all-time favorite tunes. <laughs>
instrument. The fiddle is a very old instrument. In this form, it goes back to the 1600s, uh, but bowed instruments like it go back to the time of the Bible. But the earliest instrument that we used uh, as human beings probably was probably our hands, probably just beating out a rhythm. Uh, but the second oldest instrument is one that you all have. Every single person in here has one, and that's your voice. The singing tradition of this part of the world uh, also comes a lot, is influenced a lot from the, the border counties, northern England and southern Scotland. And uh, so here's a song, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to sing you two unaccompanied pieces today. Both are West Virginia specific, they're not uh, old ballads from, from Britain although those certainly existed and thrived here. When folklorists from the Library of Congress came in 1969 and 70 and 71 to record the Hammonds family down in Pocahontas County, uh, Maggie Hammonds Parker who was a great ballad singer. They found that she knew something like 300, over 300 ballads, and many of them were ballads that she knew word for word as they were written down in books in England but nobody knew the melodies because nobody in England was still singing these songs. Isn't that amazing? They had been collected and they'd been passed down in written form, but nobody knew the melodies. And there she was singing these, these songs from, from England and, and Scotland and Ireland. Anyway, <clears throat> this is a, a portrait of what life was like when this was the frontier. And this comes from the singing of Maggie Hammonds Parker. And she called it the Bob Porter tune. And it goes like this. And this style is, is the traditional unaccompanied style. One year, one year, when bacon was scarce, and us having none, we mounted our horses and shouldered our guns. Straight away in the wild woods we did stare to kill off the wild hogs and drive in the deer. But when we got there, we rambled a while. We looked at each other and came forth a smile, saying these ain't the same hogs we fit here before. The old blue sow and the black-listed boar. Well, the old blue sow jumped up to her feet for to run. The next thing she felt was Bob Porter's old gun. The cow had a crack and the waters will roar. Your back it will ache till it's perfectly sore. So that's what a little picture of what life was like when this was the frontier. <clears throat> People would they turn their they turn their livestock. They didn't have fences. They turn their pigs out to uh, forage and eat acorns and hickory nuts and grub roots and whatever they could find and, uh, and then they would go out in the in the fall and, and hunt their own stock basically uh, which is why there's still wild boars in southern West Virginia so this instrument not this particular instrument but this the banjo uh, came to the mountains a little bit later the banjo came well, I should say the knowledge of the banjo came with uh, African slaves. This is a West African instrument. It is a drum with a strung neck attached to it. And in West Africa, to this day, similar instruments are played. But they don't have these wires. They don't have the frets to, put, to make the notes fit on the tempered scale, right? And as a matter of fact, these were a late addition uh, in this country as well. The earliest banjos here were fretless. They were like the fingerboard of a, of a fiddle. So you could slide to any note that you, you cared to. Um, this fifth string, not the short fifth string, because these African instruments have a short fifth string for droning, but they just have three melody strings. The bass string, which makes the five string banjo, was added in Virginia in 1833 by a guy named Joel Sweeney uh, who lived in uh, Appomattox, Virginia. And so this 
is what makes it an American instrument. Everything else, except for this tuner, is West African. And one of the things that came with the banjo, and that you hear in our fiddle music that you don't hear in the fiddle music of Germany and England and Scotland, is strong syncopation. Because African music is really syncopated. And rock and roll, jazz, swing, all of that syncopated music, all that syncopation came out of Africa. So, this is a this is a very old tune. It came from the first songbook that was ever published. It's called the Briggs Banjo Instructor. It was published in the 1850s. And this is called Walking in the Parlor. And uh, since we're in the parlor, that's appropriate. Um, and this particular version of this tune comes from the playing of a guy named Lee Hammonds, who was from uh, Pocahontas County, was what they called dog kin to the other Hammonds family. He was somehow related, but not closely related. He was originally from Greenberg County. But this is, uh, is Walking in the Park. tunes, starting with the older tunes, and you can hear that it's, it's more stripped down, it's more about the, the rhythm and less about the melody so much. Here's another, uh, here's a song now that comes from uh, Lee's playing, and he called it, I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. I always wondered sort of what kind of day you had to have to be having. <laughs> Except, write, write a song <clears throat> called, I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. some of the music from the Civil War era now. 
uh, as we've moved up through the earlier stuff. And the Civil War was probably the last great historical event that caused people to make new fiddle tunes in sort of numbers um, and, uh, and write new ballads. Then recorded, recorded music came along really not so long after the Civil War. The cylinder recordings happened at the end of the uh, at the end of the 19th century, and phonographs happened in the early part of the 20th century, and then the radio came along in the early 20s, and people didn't have to make their own music, and popular music happened, and things changed, as things do. And the older we get, the less we like it. <laughs> it is the truth. I find more and more recent, Recently, I find I, I'm saying more and more, you know, it didn't always used to be like this, or, you know, there used to be a house here that was, you know, the things that I rolled my eyes at, now I find myself saying. So, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, I was not present for the Civil War. However, I was lucky enough to learn to play the fiddle from a man named Mose Kaufman, um, who was born in 1905. And Mose learned to play fiddle from a man named Glenn G. Gillespie, who was born in 1840 and who was a Civil War veteran. So there was one person between me and someone born in 1840 on the fiddle. Mose started me on the banjo. I learned an awful lot from Dwight Diller and from Paul Gartner, who I played music with. Um, but <coughs> Mose started me on the banjo, and Mose learned to play the banjo from a freed slave, from a woman who was 12 years old at emancipation down in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. So um, I'm very lucky to have been born in 1966 and have a direct connection to the 1840s and 1850s in, in my music. So um, I'm going to play some more, uh, play a little more upbeat and popular sorts of music of of the Civil War era first before I, you know, break out the really depressing stuff. <laughs> yeah, the war was very depressing. Yeah, so uh, well, I'll start with, with these two tunes. The first tune is called Soldier's Joy, which is still a popular tune to this day, and bluegrass bands play it, and uh, it's been arranged for big band, and it's, but it's actually a very, very old tune, and it was an old French tune first. It was called La Tête du Roi, the King's Head. And it probably came to Scotland through the Napoleonic Wars, through the Black Watch, and became a pipe tune and a fiddle tune, and then came across here. That's my theory. So, <laughs> what is it? Uh, so, but there's a couple of words to it that I'll sing along. So. <laughs> Yeah. 
15 cents for the morphine. Yeah. yeah. Over the beer. Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a little rough. Um, but probably pretty accurate. Um, so look, one of the things that uh, interests me about the Civil War is how many of the officers on both sides were classmates at West Point. Mm -hmm. And all of those all of those Confederate generals were trained by the United States government. <laughs> Just something to think about. Um, anyway, this tune is sometimes called West Point on the Hudson. It's sometimes called Wild Horse. Um, and the West Point on the Hudson, where West Point is, is called Stony Point. And so this is a tune called Stony Point. And this is played on both sides of the, of, the, of the Civil War. And it's a wonderful, rousing kind of a tune. So, like I said, I'm setting you up for the fall. <laughs> Specific. One, uh, because it's a tune from here, but it's about a battle that took place in Virginia, uh, and it's called, it, well, it goes by two names. And those of you who are, uh, who know anything about Civil War history know that if the Confederacy won the battle, they named it after usually the nearest stream or river. Um, if the Union forces won the battle, they named it, or, or a land, land formed, right? And the Union forces usually named it after a, the nearest town. So there were two battles, one at the very beginning of the war and one toward the end of the war, fat, fought in Manassas, Virginia. Pretty much the same battlefield. The first one's called the Battle of Bull Run because the Confederates won. People came out to Manassas from Washington, D.C., in wagons with picnics to watch them fighting. They thought it would be an entertainment. They thought the thing was going to be over quickly. You know, it raged on for four and a half years or whatever. Um, I'm not a historian. But the second battle that was fought on that battlefield is called Second Manassas. Nobody ever talks about First Manassas. There's the Battle of Bull Run and Second Manassas. Right? So if you had. Um, if you had Union sympathies, you called this tune, and you, you played this tune, you called it the Battle of Bull Run. If you had Confederate sympathies, you called it Abe's Retreat. <laughs> <laughs> and since I'm a West Virginian, we call it, no, West Virginia, we split from the Confederacy. We're the only ones who left the Confederacy. So I call it the Battle of Bull Run. <laughs> and again, this has a, a very uh, lonesome sound. It's in a modal key. 
and that's real uh, typical of, of a lot of West Virginia, especially the Mountain County tunes have this kind of lonesomeness to it. So here it goes. <laughs> I think that sounds like a tune that's celebrating anything, really. It's a pretty, it's pretty mournful. Anyway, um, that Abe's Retreat, that comes from, um, comes from Calhoun County, West Virginia, that particular recording, uh, the recording that I learned that from, uh, and a guy named Harvey Sampson, a wonderful fiddle player who lived down in Calhoun County, played in the wonderful old, old style. Uh, I'm going to try something that... Excuse me. No, you're fine, please. Come on in. Grab a seat. Make yourselves, make yourselves at home. Go ahead. Thanks. Actually, you might want to sit in that chair right there, because I think she has that camera running. Oh, I'm sorry. And... You're fine. Oh, you're, you're absolutely fine. There you go. Um, I was going to try to play a tune that I learned this morning, <laughs> especially for this because I thought, oh, that's a great Civil War tune that I've been meaning to learn. And, uh, and now I'm not so sure I remember it. Um, <laughs> that's the other thing that happens as you get older. Like, I was playing it in my living room. Um, this comes from uh, the playing of Melvin Wine who lived over at Jem in uh, Braxton County. And I was lucky enough to know Melvin too. Melvin was born in 1911, and uh, we got to be friends towards the very end of his life. Um, but this is a Civil War tune that he played called Stack Em Up in Piles. <laughs> and it has, it has a much more of a martial quality to it too, I think. But, uh,
is a ballad that comes from uh, Clay County. <clears throat> the battle, battle that's described took place in uh, far western Tennessee. But there were a lot of uh, people who had been mustered up in western Virginia there uh, on both sides. There were Confederate units, units that had come up in West Virginia and there were Union un units that had come up in West Virginia and they met uh, at the Battle of Shiloh Hill in Shiloh, Tennessee. So uh, this comes from the singing of Genus Cottrell, who was the junk man down in Clay and uh, was a wonderful singer and a terrific banjo player. And he made banjos, made great banjos. And instead of using uh, wood for the pot here, he used um, an aluminum ring that came out of the torque converters of 1958 Buick Dynaglide automatic transmissions. <laughs> and they made great banjos. So. Do you know someone who has one? Yeah, mm. his brother. Yeah. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. He lives in Clay too. Well, I'd I, I would love to see it. <laughs> Talk to me after. Um, yeah, so Genus, Genus made these, and his, his sister Sylvia O'Brien had two of them. And Genus also made the, the bridges, made his own bridges, and uh, the one that Sylvia had, he made the bridge out of a pink plastic hair comb. And so, oh, hot pink. But those banjos sounded fantastic. Anyway, Genus also sang, and this comes from his singing. <clears throat> Shallow Hill. Come, all you gallant soldiers, a story I will tell about the bloody battle on top of Shiloh's Hill. It was an awful struggle, it'll cause your heart to chill. All from the bloody battle on top of Shiloh's Hill. T'was on the 6th of April, about the break of day. The drums and fives was playing for us to march away. My feelings at that moment I do remember still. When first my feet went tromping on top of Shiloh's Hill. It was about the hour of sunrise the battle it began. Before the fight was over, we fit them hand to hand. The hollers of the battle did my soul with anguish fill. From the dead and the dying on top of Shadow's Hill. T'was early the next morning, we fit the fight again. Unmindful of the wounded, unuseful to the slain. The cannon smoke did hide the sun, ten thousand was the kill. And the streams of blood went flowing on top of Shallow's Hill. My uniform of blue it had turned to a purplish red when someone on a foaming steed did strike me on the head. I sent a bullet through his heart. And as he fell away, I saw the face of my father dressed in bloody gray. Although we won the battle, my heart is filled with pain. For the one that brought me to this life I'll never see again. I pray to the Lord, consistent with his will. Lord, save the souls of them poor boys that died on Shiloh's hill. Thank you. And I'll finish with a, a <clears throat> lively, if not lonesome, tune uh, from Kanawha County. <clears throat> called uh, 
called called Elzik's Farewell. And the story is that uh, there was a fiddler by the name of Elzik, and he lived, uh, for those of you who know the Kanawha Valley at the state capital, uh, he was from right around Malden, apparently. And he was headed off to fight in the Civil War, and his mother had tuberculosis. And so he knew one way or the other that they probably would, would never see each other again. And so as he was leaving, his mother, he asked his mother if there was anything that she needed him to do or wanted him to do, and she, she said, play me one more tune. And this, as the legend goes, this is the tune that he made up for her. And he, it, it has since been called Elzik's Farewell. Thank you all for coming out, and thanks again, Jimmy, for the opportunity to play for you all. still comes from Mongolia, believe it or not. They import it from Mongolia. Their, their horses have long, strong tails, apparently. Second best comes from Canada, but the, the best comes from Mongolia, of all places. Yeah. And the stick is made of Pernambuco from the Amazon rainforest. So. I would say, uh, luck, luckily, this was this bow was made in Paris in about 1870. And so the tree that was cut down to make this bow was not cut down to clear uh, land for McDonald's cows to graze. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the fiddle itself was made in, in uh, 1798 or thereabouts. One piece back made in, in Mar and that means by the way they made instruments then and, and now, really, really fine ones, it means that the trees, the, the spruce tree that was cut down for the top on this was probably cut down in about 1750 because they would age the wood for 30 or 40 years before they would. So when this, this tree was cut down, we were still a colony. Any other, any other comments or questions? How old were you when you started? I was 27 years old when I started learning to play the fiddle, and I was 30 when I started learning to play, 28, 29 when I started playing the banjo, really, seriously. I started fooling with it when I was working with Moses Kaufman, and he died about a year and a half in, but I started to get serious with the banjo when I was about 30, so, yeah. Oh, well, 
I took one bluegrass banjo lesson in fifth grade, and then I sold, and then, and then I sold my banjo for an electric guitar so I could play in a punk rock band, <laughs> and uh, and then I and then I came back around. It was uh, Mark Twain, who who said when he left home at 18, he thought his father was the stupidest person he'd ever met. And he said, when I returned home at 21, I was amazed how much he had learned in three years. <laughs> Uh...